Let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, thanks for this uh, beautiful day. We pray that you'll bless our time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I'm going to call this the Great Spiritual Depression. I have to be honest with you, as I, I usually have an epiphany uh, about what I should title something, but uh, this week I had nothing. So I was going to do Untitled or Insert Your Own or something like that. And <laughs> And our, one of our great technical guys, Brian, suggested the Great Spiritual Depression. So uh, all emails go to him. <laughs> if you don't like it or if it doesn't relate, because he didn't really even know what I was going to talk about. But I am going to talk a little bit about that. So just a reminder, some of the alternative platforms that we have. Uh, I have not been posting on Rem Remnant Truth Network, but I did upload all the recent updates to that this week. So you can go back and start picking up there. We're also on Rumble at Real FBC. Uh, we live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we also put things up on Vimeo, and uh, we're just trying out some different alternative platforms in the event that um, the uh, the little uh, fascists at, at uh, <laughs> YouTube actually get around to us. Uh, they probably have bigger fish to fry. And uh, they don't listen to us. But listen, we look at each week about the convergence of events. And we can learn from Old Testament patterns as to what's happening. It is an incredibly uh, disruptive world. It seems like each week I, I hope that it's going to get better. But we are getting closer and closer to that time. So I'm going to start off with some scripture to maybe put things in a little bit of context, then make reference to a, great, a pretty good column that I uh, saw. And then we'll look a little bit at cultural stuff and then mostly Middle East stuff and maybe dig into some, some of the topics a little bit more uh, than we usually have time to. Uh, but there are a lot of significant things going on. Uh, there's also a lot of hype out there, so we got to try to do my best to help us sort through that. Uh, one of the things that I have learned is that... Um, Bible prophecy is very often um, based on a pattern. Uh, what happened at the first coming of Christ will be what happens at the second coming of Christ. It's also true that the spiritual failings and fall of Israel uh, in around 720 BC and then the kingdom of Judah that started in the uh, early and around 606 BC, finished up with the Babylonian captivity and destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, also give a picture of what, uh, what I think will be indicative of what's going on in the church in the last days, particularly the fall of the kingdom of Judah and the things that were going on there. And what they had in Judah was they had a great spiritual depression. Uh, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 8, I don't have any slides for this, but in Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, Ezekiel is given a vision of what's going on in Jerusalem. He's in Babylon, but he is taken back to Jerusalem, and he gets to see what's going on. And what you're going to see is the theme in Ezekiel chapter 8 is that there was a great spiritual depression. They had lost their connection to the Bible. Um, it never was there, for the, it was never there really in the northern kingdom, at least in the leadership, in the, king, in the kingly line. In the northern kingdom of Israel, after the split, after the death of Solomon, there was not a single godly king in, northern, in the northern kingdom of Israel. There were some godly kings in the southern kingdom. Some started at bad, ended good. Some started good, ended bad. But overall, the overall theme of these prophets and stories is that there was a spiritual bankruptcy that came over uh, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah and eventually led to their downfall. And I believe particularly Judah is an indication of the things that we can expect to see in the church. And we had a good example of it last week when the Pope went to, um, I almost said Babylon, he went to Iraq, <laughs> uh, the area of ancient Babylon, and he met with the Shiite leader, um, al-Sisi, or Sistani, I'm sorry. And one of the things that the Pope had done was, in, if you remember back in 2019, two years ago, the Pope went to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, and he met with the 
grand imam from the uh, Al Azhar University in Cairo. That's the place where Obama made one of his first, almost his first, foreign policy speech in his administration, June 8th of, 19, of 2009. Very significant speech. I, you should go back and review it, especially since we're now in Biden's third term, uh, or Obama's, uh, Obama's third term with the Biden administration. And what the Pope did was he signed this human fraternity document. We're all brothers. We're all going to get along. And he signed that. And so the, the guy that he signed it with in February 2019 in Dubai was the spiritual leader, the, probably the most, I think, the most important cleric in the Sunni Islam world. Islam split very early on in its existence. About 85%, and there's many, many sects of Islam, but... The largest is the Sunnis, probably 80% or so of the world Sunni, uh, world Islamic population is Sunni. And their top cleric is at Al Azhar University. And that guy went to Dubai. And you've seen the video, I've played the videos here, where they signed this document. And they said, we're all brothers. We all worship the same God. We're all children of Abraham, our father. And what Dubai is doing is they're just, I think they've broken ground on this. And this will open in 2020, uh, next year the house of all faiths, and they have a mosque, a synagogue, Jewish synagogue, and a Christian church there, and it's a unification of all these religions. Now, I think what the Pope did in his most recent trip to Iraq was he met with Sistani, who is at um, Najaf, which is, in Shiite Islam, it's probably the fourth holiest site in Islam. It is where the Imam Ali is buried. I think I mentioned last week, there's a giant cemetery there where there are easily over 5 million people have been buried. Uh, it's a pilgrimage place where uh, they were before the pandemic getting over 8 million visits a year to there. And the major Shiite cemetery, seminary, well, major Shiite cemetery and seminary, they just happen to be in the same place. And we might say they're sort of the same thing. Uh, they're located there in the city of Najaf in Iraq. Sistani is the leading cleric. He's 90. And I think what the Pope Hope had to or wanted to accomplish in this visit was to get Sistani to sign on, like the Sunni guy had signed on to this human fraternity document uh, that was signed in 2019. But Sistani did not do that. And if you look, if you want to read a little bit more about some of the details, I think that uh, Robert Spencer at Jihad Watch has some good articles about exactly what went on. He also did an interview with uh, Frank Gaffney on Secure Freedom TV. What uh, Spencer says is, listen, this was, this was a uh, submission, a further submission of a so-called Christian organization to Islam. And it never, it never goes the other way. It's Christianity kind of cuts off certain things. And this is, this is what Islam expects. Eventually, you're, all, you're either going to submit to us or you're going to agree with us. Somehow, we're going to get you. And it, it's, it's troubling that that is never really talked about by people in the press and the media, and even in the church, for that matter. So let's look at what was going on in Ezekiel chapter 8, just briefly. So Ezekiel is taken back to the temple. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness uh, as of the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire. And from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand, and took me by a lock of my head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where the seed of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Where was the seed of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy? And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the, in the plain. Then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes toward the north, and behold, at, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. And he said furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou that, that what they do, 
even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn ye thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And we have to remember, this is a place on what we now call the Temple Mount in Jerusalem that God had designated as holy. It was where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, where God provided a lamb. It is where the first and second temple stood. It was a place that was holy. And Jesus even ties into it in Matthew 24, 15. And he says, listen, when you see at the end times, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And so what we see is that there are a series, really a series of abominations that take place in this area of the temple. And some of the most egregious ones are what's related here in Ezekiel chapter 8. So I lifted, So he lifted up his eyes towards the north. In verse 6, he said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And so what you're going to see is, as Ezekiel progresses into further into the temple, the abominations get worse. And I think this is a, a picture of what's kind of going on in the church. Not kind of, it is going on in the church today. Uh, I was reading, there's a large article in Vanity Fair about what went on with Hillsong, New York, and Hillsong, and it, it's difficult to read. There were all kinds of not suspicions, witnesses as to what the pastor was doing. Everyone was told, well, just be, keep it to yourself. Be quiet about it. Now, God's not going to bless that. And eventually, Carl Lentz came to his end as a pastor there. But there was even hope that after a couple months, he was going to be restored. But then as they looked further, it wasn't one affair. It was multiple affairs that he'd had. People, a lot of people have come forth from Hillsong, New York, saying the spiritual abuse that took place, that sort of thing, and sort of the party-type atmosphere, which is when you really, it shouldn't be a surprise. Because, in a sense, the glory of the Lord had departed from that place if it was ever there in the first place. And this is what's happening with Ezekiel, verse 7. And he brought me to the door of the court. When I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw. And behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So there was idolatry going on, a violation of one of the early commandments. And so we think that you know, it, we, it's easy to say, we look at the house of all faiths, and it's easy to say, boy, that, that's got to be an abomination to the Lord, the, trying to synchronize false religion with true religion. Well, there it's synchronizing all the false religions, uh, monotheistic religions, and I'm sure eventually they're going to add a Hindu temple and a Buddhist temple and that type of thing there as well. But this is happening in the church today. Similar things. So I went in and behold, I saw every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed on the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said unto me, son of man, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. God's on vacation. We can do whatever we want. He said also to me, verse 13, turn thee yet again, and thou wilt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations of these. And he brought me into the inner house, inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men, 
with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled their land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. And so what you see what happens is when, when people abandon God, what's the old saying? When, when people don't believe in God, they don't believe in nothing. They'll believe anything. And that's a pretty good picture or a good statement about our culture today. As people have departed away from any semblance of pr- godly principles, the culture has gone into a pretty severe decline. It's unmistakable. Now I'll refer to an article in just a moment, but let's look at a couple cultural things that are going on. So here's an example. This is Scotland. I've talked about this hate crime bill that they have. The hate crime bill passed uh, the Scottish Parliament and I believe is now law. It essentially makes any offensive statement a hate crime. Although they did put into it sort of like, well, this is subject to the principles of Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which, quote, allows for the expression of information or ideas that offend, shock, or disturb, as well as for discussion and criticism. Now, how far do you think that that's going to go? (laughs) I'm not optimistic. One of the amendments they tried to get into this act was a um, dwelling defense, so that you could not be prosecuted for things that you said in your own house with your own family. And, what it, the, and that amendment failed. Now, this um, Yusuf, the guy who's the attorney general, I think, or minister of justice in Scotland, he said, well, we, you know, we'll put that in. We're, we're going we're gonna, to, yeah, there's some things here that are concerning. We're going to clean it up. And they didn't clean it up. Because why? Because they're politicians and they've completely gone off the rails and they're buying into this whole woke, I'll call it woke theology that's taking over everything. This week, uh, Christopher Rufo, who does, I think, well, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Let me get to uh, this first. This is a good article at... uh, TK News, the Sovietization of the American Press. The author of this blog says this, I collect Soviet newspaper. Years ago, I used to travel to Moscow's flea market every few weeks, hooking up with a dealer who crisscrossed the country, digging up front pages from the Cold War era. I have these, he said, these relics with dramatic black, black fonts and red highlights are cool pieces of history. Not so cool is the writing. Soviet newspapers were wrought with such uh, anvil shamelessness that it's difficult to imagine anyone ever read them without laughing. A good Soviet could write about almost any Pravda headline in advance. What else but, quote, a mighty demonstration of the union of the party and the people and fit the day after the Supreme Soviet elections? What news could come from the Spanish Civil War but success of the Republican fleet? Who could earn an Obed headline but a faithful son of the party? Reality in Soviet news was 100% binary with all people either heroes or villains and the villains all in league with one another. And at the height of the Soviet Union, over a million people were employed, employed to do propaganda. Some of them seem to have migrated to other countries and become members of the press where truth really is not... A value. So what this this author does, and I think he does a very good job of, is he says it's happening in America. This Sovietization of the press. Look at these headlines from the passage of the uh, stimulus bill. Someone suggested in my title to debate this should follow up on Charles' sermon from first hour, the feeding of the four thousand, and call it the feeding of the three hundred thirty million. That was Brian again. So again, emails go to, it's very productive today. 
But look at this. this. So this is what they write. Biden's stimulus showers money on Americans, targets poverty. Assuming he even knows about it. Here's this. This is from, so that's from the Washington Post. Here's from the New York Times. Look at this. Champion of the middle class comes to the aid of the poor. Can you believe it? <laughs> and then, of course, uh, the Communist News Network. Look at what they say. Biden's historic victory for America. No thanks to GOP. And that's sort of the state of the world. Now, Christopher Rufo uh, is a great blogger. He writes for City Journal. He has his own blog. Real Chris, Chris Rufo is his Twitter handle. And so he comes out this week and he covers these um, woke indoctrination programs that are going everywhere. He tore apart what they're doing in Seattle and other cities. Um, he's, I think he's done a series... <laughs> if he has it, some other people at City Journal have talked about what's going on at Buffalo. And I've, I've relayed some of these stories to you. Well, now he goes back to California. We've talked about California a little bit. And what California has done, Cal, he says this scoop, California's proposed ethnic studies curriculum, which is supposed to come up for approval this week, <coughs> calls for the decolonization of American society and has students chant to the Aztec god of human sacrifice. The solution, according to one author, is a counter-genocide against white Christians. Look at some of this stuff. Um, uh, here's, well, this is from the Buffalo schools. Look at this one. Culturally and linguistically responsive initiatives. Who writes this nonsense? Here's one, uh, here's a part of their curriculum. Goal, infusing culturally responsive resources and lessons into the curriculum. Diverse literature will be infused into 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade ELA curriculums. And you see one of the things they do here, 7th to 12th grade will study the 1619 project. The 1619 project it's typical. There's, there's some things in there that are true, but the whole thing is a pack of lies. And the author of that has been caught, and she just says, well, I'm just trying to get people thinking. And that's not what she's trying to do. She's trying to indoctrinate them into this woke mentality. Where, and they talk about erasing whiteness. Look over here in another part of the curriculum, the ELA and Social Studies Department in collaboration with the offices of CLRI, will roll out curriculum resources and materials for the 1619 project, which will be implemented at grades 7, 8, 11, and 10, 12. So back to Christopher Rufo and what he's found and relayed about California. Here's his article. Um, this guy, what, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the original co-chair of the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum developed much of the material regarding early American history. In his book, Rethinking Ethnic Studies, which is cited throughout the curriculum, this author argues that the United States, this is the 1619 Project writ large, was founded on a Eurocentric white supremacist, meaning racist, anti-black, anti-indigenous, capitalist, classes, patriarchal, sexist, and mis misogynistic, heteropatriarchal, homophobic, and anthropocentric paradigm brought from Europe. The document claims that whites began grabbing the land, hatching hierarchies, and developing for Europe whiteness. And listen, this explains why even uh, the Gates Foundation funded Educating for Justice that I referenced talks about when they're doing their math curriculum that, you know, we really can't, you, you, if somebody raises their hand, that's an example of white patriarchy and power. And you call on them to give an answer. You're, you're, you're acting white. And if you're insisting on a correct answer, you're asking white, acting white. And so that's why companies like Coke are now saying, we got to get rid of whiteness or you have to get down and repent of your whiteness. 
And I'm like, I was just trying to get the right answer in math. Do you understand how far down the road we've gone on this? That the, at some point, there, there are still some good schools around, but people have to seriously consider getting your kids out of the public schools. I have to tell you, I've also been shared information about Christian schools across the country, and they're into it too. And you need to go to the, these administrators, and you need to demand that they stop. And if they don't, you got to pull your kids out. I know it's difficult, but uh, your kids' souls are at stake. So there's the ethnic studies community chant. And what they say, they will, uh, so, well, let me go to this. Rufo says this, in theoretical terms, the new ethnic studies curriculum is based on the pedagogy of the oppressed, developed by Marxist theoretician Paolo Freire, who argue that students must be educated about their oppression in order to attain critical consciousness and consequently develop the capacity to overthrow their oppressors. Following this dialectic, the model curriculum instructs teachers to help students challenge racist, bigoted, discriminatory, imperialist, colonial beliefs and critique white supremacy, racism, and other forms of power and oppression. Listen, the people that are rioting nightly in Portland and other cities have been completely taken over by this ideology. The only answer to all of this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen. ultimately, okay? Um, but you got to protect your kids from it. You know, that in, in children. And so I, I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, we did have a president who stopped this. This training was going into all levels of our government. He stopped it, and he's gone, and guess what? It's been reinstated immediately. So our, this is what our government is doing to government employees. So it goes on to say this. The religious narrative is even more distributing, disturbing. Quathen the author, developed a related Mandela claiming that white Christians committed theocide against indigenous tribes, killing their gods and replacing them with Christianity. White settlers thus established a regime of coloniality, dehumanization, and genocide. And you see ridiculous things. I mean, you, you know, the indigenous people were perfect. They didn't do anything, right? They never did anything wrong. I remember years ago, Pam and I went to Mesa Verde in Colorado. And the guy was talking about, this is 1999. The guy was talking about, listen, you know, the tribes came, they've lived here in these cliff dwellings and look how magnificent they are. And they're great. They're unbelievable for done in the 11, uh, you know, the 12th century, before the 12th century AD. But then they just disappeared. Nobody says, what did they do? What? So then the, the guy, I'm sure they don't say this today, but he goes, well, they over farmed and they changed the climate. And as a result, they had to leave. And I asked them, were they using the creek down there for their bathroom? And he, he didn't really answer that question. Um, but they weren't perfect, okay? Nobody's perfect. So this is, uh, so he goes on. The solution according to this curriculum developer in the ethnic studies curriculum is to name, speak, to resist, transform, the hegemonic Eurocentric neocolonial condition and a posture of transformational resistance. This is the, the uh, and these people get PhDs writing like this. The ultimate goal is to decolon decolonize American society and establish a new regime of counter genocide. The religious concept is fleshed out in the model curriculum's official ethnic studies community chant. Their curriculum recommends that students lead their students in a series of indigenous songs, chants, and affirmations, including Enlok Ek affirmation, which appeals directly to the Aztec gods. Students must first clap and chant to the god Tezcatlipoca, or whatever, whom the Aztecs traditionally worshipped with human sacrifice and cannibalism, asking him to be warriors for social justice. Now listen, when the guy says you need to chant this guy, this Aztec god name, 
and what he stands for, and he talks about counter-genocide, what do you think he means? And here's a symbol of this Aztec god. And here is a short clip of the chant that they want the kids to do, one of the chants they want the kids to do every day. So you can go online and download this stuff. It's easily, easy to find. The chants have a clear implication, the displacement of the Christian God, which is said to be an extension of white supremacist oppression. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and the restoration of the indigenous gods to their rightful place in the social justice cosmology. It is, in a philosophical sense, a revenge of the gods. California parents, Rufo says, should be concerned under the guise of equity and empowerment. Activists, and how does this not violate the First Amendment if you can't use the Bible at school? I, after the Supreme Court decision banning prayer in the public schools, I remember 1966, five, 1965 and 66, I was in sixth grade. And we had devotion, we had, had a Bible reading every morning in class. Now, I'm sure the ACLU today would go crazy. Uh, and, they, and so we read a Bible passage until one of my little friends brought in this book. Uh, this is a sidebar again, uh, Rabbit Trail. And he brought in this book, and I took it home, and I'm reading it. And I've always looked at the footnotes, even in sixth grade. And I'm reading the footnotes, and it's referring to this thing called the Watchtower and the 144,000. It was, it was a Jehovah's Witness book. So I took it downstairs, showed my dad, said, hey, I'm supposed to read devotions tomorrow, but this book doesn't seem right. So the next morning, uh, Reverend Haller took little Johnny <laughs> down to see uh, my teacher, Mr. Dabney, and said, let's use this one instead. It was a Bible. And Mr. Dabney said, thank you for catching that. So... No recriminations or anything, just stood up for what was true. Rufo says they have recast the United States as an oppressor nation that must be de deconstructed and subverted through politics. The curriculum's vision statement makes the same explicit. It presents education not as a means of achieving competency, but as a tool for transformation, social, economic, and political change and liberation. And this is what the... We have these people in charge of our government. Here's a state of New York has a new proposal for sex education starting in kindergarten. This is a law in front. Like, with that governor, you really need to make more of him? Really? Here's the, uh, the intersection, the matrix of social identity and intersectional power. This comes from the, part of the author of this curriculum. Uh, look at this thing. This, you're supposed to find where you are on the charts and you know who you are and where you fit. Here's somebody who's done this exercise at a university that shows, okay, where they fit on the chart, you know, because they're, uh, they're female, they're middle class, access to resource information and influence. Yes, yeah, so you have to color that in. And so this is, that's how the... That's their Rorschach test, I guess, as to what they are. And I don't know what that, it looks like kind of a bat flying in to take your soul away, but just my opinion. Here's another thing I saw. This is, I forget which school I found this thing. The Soji Astronaut, a galaxy of limited possibilities. Gender identity, gender expression, pronouns attracted to. This is for kids. Um, SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Expression. Because this, and this is what's important. I, I downloaded this from a UC Davis site. This is their application now for 
graduate studies program. And here is the one thing that says, how do you describe yourself? What is the sex on your birth certificate? And you have, cho and you have there's a drop down area for a number of choices. You know, male, female, transgender, other, that type of thing. It's, um, it's insane. So a couple more things and we'll get to the Middle East. When I look at this whole panoply of things that are going on, I keep, I look at the unusual things that are all happening at the same time, the convergence. You know, so here's a couple. So this is a change in the Gulf Stream. I talked a little bit about this last week, front page in the New York Times yesterday. If the Gulf Stream is indeed cooling, it's going to completely change Europe. Uh, we may be entering into a mini ice age. And it's hard, and look, whether you like, they'll all say this is climate change and that type of thing. I, I'm not convinced of that. Part of me thinks that this is God sending humanity a wake-up call. When you see all these things begin to happen, remember? Here's another one. This is a living planet, I think it's called. Now, listen, they're climate change activists and that sort of thing. So I'm not, not telling you to adopt their language, but there is data behind what they are seeing that's really unmistakable. And one of these is that species are dying out. They're talking about losing one third of all fish, freshwater fish on the planet in the near term. They're talking about losing all insects. Now listen, this does have sort of the revelation apocalyptic biblical support for it. And we can pass it off if that's just a bunch of crazy climate change people. But what if it's really, I think it's really happening. Uh, we've had the bee problem. So here's a look at uh, bio, the, the decline in biodiversity. And it's at different rates in different places. So it's less, it's like down about 17% in North America. But in South America, it's down 95%. And I saw an article this week that, you know, they always say the Amazon is the earth, the lungs of the earth. Now they say oh, the Amazon is really off gassing a lot of stuff and it's, it's really a bigger, could, it's a bigger problem than a, than a help. So it all changes. And at some point, look, it's easy to come up with natural explanations for everything. But at some point, we need to acknowledge that there's a supernatural aspect that I think is involved in a lot of this, and it's really setting the world up. So when, when you talk about the fish dying off, is there not a prophecy in Revelation that talks about a third of the oceans polluted and the fish died? The ships? Not, I'm just saying something is going on and you need to pay attention. So now I'm going to talk about the Middle East for the rest of this. And I apologize if this bounces around a little bit because there were a lot of interconnected parts and I tried to put them into a nice, logical, coherent package. And I'm not sure I succeeded. Uh, the proof will be in what I'm going to say over the next while uh, after I do this. The first thing, um, the fourth election of Israel is a week in the last two years is a week from Tuesday. On March 23rd, this is the fourth election in two years. The word from Israel is people just aren't really all that interested. And I'm like, who's interested in waterboarding yourself? I mean, really, this, you have to go through this campaign for the fourth time. And it's very complicated. So the two conservative parties, so Lapid is up to like 18 and... Um, Gideon Czar and uh, Naftali Bennett are 11 and 10. And they, they're saying, we're not going to go in a coalition with Netanyahu. So a lot of it is an anti-Netanyahu thing. 
But Lapid is a left winger. I mean, he is a radical left winger. And he was down to like the, one of the last four, three elections. He's down to like three or four seats in his party. Now he's back up to 18. Uh, Avigor Lieberman there um, with, uh, I think it's Israel Betanyahu, part, Betanyahu party, mainly Russian Jewish immigrants. He's always at six or seven. He's, and he doesn't, he, would not get, he doesn't like the Orthodox Jews. In fact, he said this week that uh, Orthodox Jewish politicians need to just leave. And I don't know if he meant leave the country, leave politics, or leave the planet. I'm not sure what he was saying. He was the tra- I get li- lose a little bit in the translation. So this is, uh, this is a problem. Let's see, you got to get there. Okay. So now let's talk about some of the things that went on this week. Now you're going to hear a lot of, oh wow, things about this. And I would say there is an oh wow aspect to it. A Saudi cartoonist and a Moroccan guy, they've, they've set up this Twitter hashtag. I can't remember the name of it. And they're saying, listen, we're not interested in, we're not interested in the Temple Mount. It, it's really Jewish. We have our holy sites in Mecca and Medina. That's what we should focus on. We don't pray towards Jerusalem. We pray towards Mecca. Well, that's not exactly true. If you pray facing the Qibla and the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, do you know that it doesn't face towards Mecca? Did you know that? All of the early mosques in what's now Syria and Israel and elsewhere that were built you know, back in the 700s, 800s they don't point towards Mecca. They all point towards Petra in Jordan. Now, Jay Smith has done some great work on unpacking this. You can find his videos online. And it really sort of undermines the, some of the foundations of Islam. And I'll talk about another one here. So, you know, a lot of people are saying, I saw articles in the Israeli press, the Saudis don't want anything to do with the Temple Mount. Well, that's, that's way overstated. That's not exactly what they said. This is a few Saudis and a Moroccan that like Israel. And I think when you really unpack what they believe, you kind of understand why they're sort of pro-Israel. And they are pro-Israel. And, and these particular people and some of their followers, but I, I, they believe that the Temple Mount is Jewish. And the Temple Mount is Jewish. There's no question about that. I'm going to go through that a little bit here in a moment. But I think it's just overstating the case to say that all Saudis believe this. It's some Saudis believe this. There's a fight going on in the Saudi royal family right now over the Palestinians. You've seen the former, one of the former ministers, his interview, we got to protect the Palestinians. You can see another former minister in the Saudi royal family saying, we're done with the Palestinians. And so one of the guys who started this hashtag is a cartoonist. And when you look at some of the cartoons that he's drawn, you will understand why he might lean pro-Israel, or is he pro-Israel or anti-Palestinian? Here's one of his editorial cartoons. So do you see that? That is a Palestinian mother feeding her Palestinian child, and she's using oil. So he's not pro-Palestinian. So... While he did, this is a video, this is part of his Twitter post, is this picture of the Temple Mount with a temple, the Jewish temple ascending or descending on it. And a lot, and so everybody gets excited about that because we read the prophecies of Daniel and that type of thing. But I think it's overstating it to say that this is all Saudis. There is a growing sentiment about this there is an intellectual basis for this. I'll get to that in just a moment. There are other things going on. So this is an article on the right in the Wall Street Journal on Friday or yesterday. 
and then from the Times of London this morning, Israel, Israeli special forces secretly sabotaged Iranian oil tankers. And they've looked back to about a dozen attacks on Israel, or, uh, Iranian oil tankers over the last couple of years. And they say they had these mysterious explosions and that type of thing. It must be Israel special forces. Now, Danny Gantz, the defense minister, was asked about this. And again, um, trying to translate from the Hebrew newspaper, essentially says, look, yeah, I will, well, he didn't say, yeah, we did that. He just says, we'll do whatever we need to do to protect Israel. End of discussion. So does that mean that he did it? And then immediately there's another attack, and there's news about that this morning, and everybody's going, see, there you go, told you, that's exactly what's happening. Now, another story this week, and this is kind of interesting in foreign policy. It said, Israel is the Arab world's new soft power. When you unpack the URL, though, it says Israel is the Arab world's new great power. So I don't know if this headline got changed or somebody messed up on the URL. It just seemed like there was kind of a little bit of an inconsistency. And what it talks about is the rise of Israel over the last few years. The Arab states in the Gulf are saying, listen, we have to protect ourselves against Iran. We cannot allow Iran to continue to attack us, to threaten us. They want to shove their version of Islam down us and dominate us. We want to protect our own ethnic identities that sort of thing. So Israel is one of the more powerful militaries in the world, certainly within the top 10. The Arab states say they're making a pragmatic choice. We don't like everything about Israel, but they got money. They got military power. We're going to uh, work with them. So what you're seeing and I do believe that this is these Abraham Accords are, perf are sort of in this stage setting thing of fulfilling Bible prophecy because of the economic aspect of this. We know that when Israel um, enters into this ultimate agreement with the Antichrist, there will be a heavy economic component to that. What you see in these Abraham Accords is the continual emphasis of the economic component. This is what this article talks about, that there are agreements that are being in, entered into between uh, the UAE and Israel. Now, back in 2020, they were saying, Gulf Israel ties, and, and some of the people that are quoted in the article on foreign policy also actually helped author this article back in April of 2019, saying that was before Trump came out with the Peace and Prosperity Plan, but I believe it was after they had that economic summit in Manama, in Bahrain, that Jared Kushner ran. And they're saying, listen, the Trump Peace Plan, if it's not going to be a full Palestinian state, it's going to blow apart uh, whatever ties are developing between the Gulf states and Israel is going to be blown apart. And I'm just saying is the, in this case, their prognostication was not correct because the Trump plan came out. And even though people didn't think it had any chance of succeeding, it did result in the Abraham Accords came out of it. And the Saudis, at least the leadership of the Saudis have been very much interested in making some kind of resolution with Israel. I think there's a reason for it. And again, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, because I, I think if we trace the development of some things, we'll see why this is happening. So one of the, there was a big article, number of articles that appeared back in um, October 2020 that I don't think a lot of us really noticed. And so people noticed that now all of everybody's talking about it. UAE and Israel open talks on one secret crude oil pipeline. 
What they're talking about is this, the Alot Ashkelon pipeline. This was built many, many years ago, decades ago. It's not a super large pipeline, but it runs from Alot to Ashkelon on the Mediterranean, and it also has a connection up to the port in Haifa. The interesting thing is that this pipeline was a joint venture, 50-50 ownership. And by the way, I will tell you as an attorney, somebody says, hey, enter into your, this agreement and we'll have a 50-50 ownership, fire the attorney. Never have a 50-50 ownership, sorry, never. It works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it's a huge mess. Um, it, for anybody, as long as you can afford the attorney's fees, you know, the attorneys will try to unpack it. So it's sort of a full employment act for attorneys to do these 50-50 partnerships. Yeah, I'm not even sure I would do it. Is PM back there? I'm not even sure I would do it with my wife, okay? No offense. Um, Believe me, I'm not going to get the. I'm not going to be on the 51 percent side of any deal there. So, no, I'm just I'm joking. But it's when you're working with somebody outside your family, it's not a good situation. So, so they the joint venture was between Israel and Iran. And even after the Islamic Revolution in 1979, when Ayatollah Khomeini came to power and took out the Shah, this was pipeline was built back in the days of the Shah. The, uh, they continued to pump oil through the pipeline in a joint venture. But eventually the thing got shut down and it sort of became a, a secret around much of Israel. People didn't really know about it. Now, it's not a huge pipeline. It can transit about 600,000 barrels of oil per day. Um, that leads to, like, is this the best way? So what, what happened... Just this past week, though, is that um, I think it was this week, Israel pipeline company signed a deal to bring United Arab Emirates oil to Europe. So what will happen in the deal is that the United Arab Emirates will ship oil from their location there in the Gulf through the Straits of Hormuz up through the Straits of Menjeb. Uh, to a lot and use the pipeline to get the oil to the Mediterranean instead of going through the Suez Canal. Part of the reason is it, it costs a few dollars to do a barrel of oil through the pipe, a pipeline. It is much slower. Uh, it would cost, um, depending on the size of ship, to go through the Suez Canal, the transit fees through the Suez Canal are somewhere between half a million and about $1.2 million for an oil tanker. It's not cheap. So when you're looking at, you know, 10 or 15 or $20 a barrel of oil versus three or $4 a barrel of oil, that's a significant, uh, um, that's a significant uh, savings. And they don't have the ability to handle those large super tankers through the Suez Canal. It was built back in the 1800s. It was built before we even had electric power around the world. And the advantage of the Suez Canal, though, is it's all sea level all the way through, so there are really no locks to go through. And you can transit, uh, unless there's a, a jam up in traffic, you can transit the Suez Canal in about 12 or 16 hours. 12 to 16 hours, which is a lot shorter time than going all the way down around the Horn of Africa and all the way up around that way, which can take weeks, months. So it, it is a significant savings. So the pipeline is to help take some of that pressure off. Now, Egypt's not going to be happy with this because they make billions off of the Suez Canal each year and anything that takes away from that. But the pipeline infrastructure is already there. And the United Arab Emirates says, hey, we're economic partners in everything now. So we've got an Israeli company, and we have a, a UAE company, and we're going to enter into this agreement for oil. Now, there are problems with even that deal. That deal requires the oil 
to go through the Straits of Hormuz, through the Straits of Manjab, past Yemen. And a little bit of a war going on in Yemen right now. And there's this is a picture of a tanker that has been, was attacked by the Houthi rebels. It's on the verge of sinking and breaking apart in the Red Sea. If it breaks apart, it will release oil, five times as much oil as the Exxon Valdez released. That will have a big pollution. It will be one of the largest oil spills in history. And that's on the verge of happening. That's, it's been sitting there for months. It's disabled. Nobody knows what to do with it. And so to avoid that problem, they're coming up with yet another solution. Um, let's see. That's a, So... And there are a couple other solutions that are coming about too. Uh, these are uh, land bridges that, you know, railways and roads that are being built across from Iraq and Iran to Syria. This is why Iran is so interested in Syria, is they want to get transit all the way to the Mediterranean. So they don't have to worry about the Straits of Hormuz, which they control effectively, or they can shut down. Now, this is a, a video of the Middle East. I pulled this off a Azerbaijani website. This, I love this guy's graphics. And he's talking about, okay, look at what is going on with Israel and these different Arab countries. And now one of the things that's being proposed, and it's already in place to a great extent, is a railway. That's the black dotted line. That railway would come, it would come up into Jordan, it would go south to a lot. It would also go to Haifa. I've talked about this in the past. So we have the, the existing pipeline in Israel from a lot to Ashkelon. And now we have this uh, pipeline that they're talking building from, through Sa or not, rail I'm sorry, railway through Saudi Arabia up to, Is up to uh, Haifa and a lot. So this is a very significant thing that there's this economic, but see again, it's this economic cooperation between Israel and the Arab states. Uh, what's the old saying? Follow the money. And I want to get up here to the next part. Okay, so this is the development. So we're going to do this railway uh, to Israel. And what the, the money would then, the oil would then come and goods would come They'd be offloaded onto ships in Haifa or Ashkelon at the ports, and then transit to Europe. Save a lot of time going around the Horn of Africa, and maybe Egypt won't let the United Arab Emirates run their tankers with their tankers with their oil in it through the Suez Canal, because maybe some people in Egypt don't like Israel. Now, right now. You know, there's a peace treaty, but who knows how long that's going to take. And then you have these, oh, these are all the countries that have entered into normalization agreements with Israel. But you still have the, the choke points there of the Straits of Hormuz, because Iran is interfering with everything. And then you also have Yemen and the problems over at the Straits of Minjib. So you can see there's, that's the Straits of uh, Hormuz there, and then you will go down here. The next one will be the Straits of Banjab. Those are choke points. So people are trying to get around those choke points because there's a lot of conflict in the Middle East right now. So one is this Elat Ashkelon um, pipeline. But there's also the thing here with the Straits of Banjab and coming up through the Red Sea. So usually you go up through the Suez Canal, this part of the Red Sea, but you can go up to Lot. That's where the pipeline would run. But there's a pro there's a, and that's kind of an interesting thing. But a lot of people, I think this is sort of what's behind the Saudis' apparent interest in reaching some kind of an agreement. Um, this is, requires a bit of a history lesson. In 1967, we had the Six-Day War. It was a stunning victory by Israel, miraculous, absolutely miraculous in many parts. 
And one of the things that happened was Israel gained control of Jerusalem. And so this is the front page of the New York Times, June 8th, 1967. Israel sweeps ahead on all fronts. But understand, and so what Israel did in that war was they took over the Sinai Peninsula. They didn't even really expect that. They were able to gain control of that and all the way to the Suez Canal. It was a stunning victory. Part of the reason for that war, though, was what was going on down here in the Straits of Manjeb. Or I'm sorry, at, um, yeah, no, at, at a lot. The um, Straits of Tehran, T-I-R-A-N. Sorry, I get my names that I don't know mixed up. So this area right here, what happened was Egypt controlled the Sinai Peninsula. And one of the reasons for the Six-Day War was Nasser shut down traffic in the Red Sea. That made it very, that eliminated one of the ways Israel got its goods. They would ship them to a lot, transport them up into uh, the populated part of Israel. And that's what led to the war. In 1973, there was yet another war. And this was um, initially Egypt came in and they shoved the Israelis back, but then the Israelis pushed back. It was the Yom Kippur War of 1973. That led to the Camp David Accords. Um, after the war was over, there were negotiations, and eventually Carter was able to bring Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat to Israel, or to Washington, and get a peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. It was about a year and a half later that Anwar Sadat was assassinated by elements in the, I think, Muslim Brotherhood elements within the Egyptian military that did not like any kind of an agreement with Israel. But nevertheless, that peace treaty has held, even though the Muslim Brotherhood came to power for a short time, uh, they were taken over by uh, el-Sisi, the current leader. And that all happened with the Arab Spring. By the way, it's 10 years ago this week that the Syrian civil war started in Dara in Southern Syria. I saw an editorial in one of the Arab newspapers this morning saying, did anybody think the Syrian civil war is really going to be solved in the next 10 years? (laughs) The answer is probably not. But back to the Camp David Accords. One of the very important parts of the Camp David Accords was that that um, Egypt guaranteed in the agreement Israel would have passage into the Red Sea through the states of Tehran. Fine. That, but now, back, this is from the Jerusalem Post back in 2015, the Jerusalem Post was saying, hey, why don't we build an Israel Suez Canal from a lot up to Ashkelon or Ashdod? We can, and we'll do it so it can handle the super tankers and we'll take all the business away from the Egyptians or business that nobody gets. So we have the pipeline now, we have a proposed canal. Now, I don't know if the canal is going to happen. It would be a massive engineering thing to do because of the mountainous nature of the region that it would have to go through. But it's possible they could go up through the Negev, but they still got mountains they got to get across. But nevertheless, back in 2015, they were talking about it. And now again, they're talking about it because now they have the agreements, normalization agreements with these Arab states. But this is why Saudi Arabia is interested. In 2016, Egypt transferred the Tehran. There's two islands there in the Tehran state Strait transferred them to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia would like to do something with that region. And that leads to the next point is why Saudi Arabia is doing this is because Saudi Arabia wants to build this city called Neom. So you see the Sinai Peninsula there and that green area is Neom. They want to build a bridge across the Straits of Tehran it would cost billions of dollars. It's, you know, it's not, it's an o- open ocean. But they would use the islands that they have and they would enter into an agreement with Israel. Listen, we'll, we'll, we will 
build this bridge, we will protect your passage. And believe me, that is part of the discussion on normalization agreements with Saudi Arabia. So again, what you see is as part of this, these normalization agreements is this heavy economic component. That's why I think it's important. But really, those islands there now belong to Saudi Arabia. Mohammed bin Salman, who's the current crown prince, he wants to build the um, city of Neom. So he's trying to push for normalization with Israel so he can accomplish his goals of building the city. And they've already started building it. You saw a little clip there at the beginning. So understand that there's all these different things converging at one time in the Middle East, which is sort of the center of where all the, a lot of this Bible prophecy, geopolitical Bible prophecy stuff is fulfilled. So very interesting that that happens. At the same time, uh, we've talked about this many times. Um, Libya and Turkey entered, entered into this sort of faux agreement that they would have this joint economic zone. And what they're trying to do is cut off the, pat, the pipeline that Israel wants to build. They say, well, we control this area of the ocean. You have to get our approval to do it. Well, don't, don't go to Greece. Just come up here to Turkey and we'll build a pipeline or connect our pipelines and transit your gas and oil to Europe. Uh, by the way, there's a fee you know, that we get for that. But, this, but you understand, that you, so you see this gas and oil thing that's kind of coming to the fore. But Turkey, but what happened was, you can see here the Greece flag and the Egypt flag, they've entered into an agreement just in about last week or so about their joint economic zone. And they're saying, Turkey, you really only get the red part under international law. We get all the rest. Turkey, you're out of luck, shut up, go away. So now Turkey is putting in their press, well, we're entering into negotiations, we're close to an agreement with Egypt, but the reality is I don't think there are any negotiations going on. Turkey, or Egypt is essentially telling Turkey, go away. So Turkey is, and then Turkey comes out and says, you know, we're close to an agreement with Israel too for an economic zone uh, for us. And so you need to understand, Turkey does not like having just that red area. And it's arguable under international law. That's all they get to control the Mediterranean. They want more because there's all kinds of gas under the Mediterranean, but they don't have any uh, geopolitical rights to it. So they're trying to, that's why they went to Libya. You know, they want to go to, they supposedly have an agreement with Gaza. You know, they're trying to get control of everything because what Turkey has done is this thing called Mavi Vatan, Blue Homeland. So you see Turkey there and you see the blue water. That's what Turkey says, that's ours. That's what we get to control. And in fact, a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, Erdogan was photographed in front of that map. And one of the officers declared at the time he was doing this, this is a quote, while performing our duties, we are proud to wave our glorious Turkish banner in all our air, all our seas. I submit that we are truly, that we are ready to protect every swath of our 462,000 square meter blue homeland with great determination and undertake every positive duty that may come. Now there's a lot of speculation about how does this Ezekiel 38 war come about? It may be that this gas oil thing is one of the precipitating factors. Turkey wants its blue homeland. Other people, Greece, uh, Crete, Cyprus, and everything, they're saying, wait a minute, this is not, um, this is not coming together. Or we're, we're not, we don't like what Turkey's doing. So in fact, this week, Israel, Crete, Cyprus, and, and Greece entered into a a uh, sharing power agreement, not political power, but electric power for a backup grid for Israel. That's kind of significant. And so that's another factor. And then you also have this. Rush, this is uh, Russia's project, Nord Stream 2, to more than double the amount of gas that it can ship into Europe. And Russia has a lot of gas and nat natural resources of that type. So they want to propose this Nord Stream 2, but because of sanctions that are being imposed, 
companies are withdrawing from this, and Nord Stream 2 looks like it's maybe going to fizzle. So now Russia's losing what they thought was going to be a great source of revenue for the transit of gas into Europe. Israel's trying to transit its gas into Europe, and now they're talking with the Gulf states about using a lot and a pipeline and maybe a new canal to transit oil and gas to Europe. I don't think Russia will be happy about that. So this week what happened was um, Sergei Lavrov, who is the foreign minister of Russia, made a tour of the Gulf states. He went to Saudi Arabia, met with the foreign minister and Crown Prince, that's his meet, picture of his meeting with uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Then he went to the United Arab Emirates and met with the foreign minister. He also went to, uh, I believe, Bahrain and Qatar for meetings. Didn't go to Turkey, didn't go to Iran. He went to these others because they're trying to get back in the game there in the Middle East because they need the money and revenue. This is my, now this is my opinion. So this week, for the fourth time, uh, Netanyahu was to go to the United Arab Emirates. The last three got canceled, coronavirus, et cetera, et cetera. Everything was in place. And, you know, and the word was that he was actually going to meet Mohammed bin Salman in Dubai or in uh, the United Arab Emirates. Now, that was never really confirmed. They never confirmed the meeting that they had a few months ago. But then all of a sudden, the meeting got canceled. And this is the headline in Friday's Jerusalem Post. Prime Minister trip to UAE nixed after Jordan denies airspace access. What happened was that um, Jordan threw a hissy fit about some other things that they saw going on with regard to the Jordanian control over the Temple Mount. This is very interesting. I find this interesting. This is, but I, you know, I geek out on this stuff. So, um, but what happened was that for the first time in a long time, a member of the royal family in Jordan, the crown prince, um, Hussein Ben Abdullah, I think is his name. He's in his 20s. He was to visit the Temple Mount. But they needed security arrangements. And these are very important to the, Jordan, to the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Because if you don't remember from history, back in 1951, uh, King Abdullah, the king of Jordan, was visiting the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And a Palestinian assassinated him. This is 1951. And so the Jordan, you know, the people remember their history in the Middle East. A lot of times they, they make it up too, a lot of the time as well. But this is actual historical fact. And accompanying him on that trip, who just barely escaped being assassinated himself, was a 15-year-old named Hussein, who be, later became King Hussein. Uh, King Hussein's father, he was the one that um, you saw, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with him. He was only 32 when the Six-Day War started in 1967. He was a young guy. He succeeded to the throne when he was about 17. His father ruled for, after his grandfather was killed, his father ruled for about a year, but a lot of people didn't like him, the British didn't like him, and eventually he was declared mentally insane and taken away from the throne. Which I've heard the Brits have done in the past, and their own families. Uh, just saying. Um, so what happened was he wanted a security detail, and Israel had agreed to everything, you can bring this many guys, armed to the Temple Mount. So he shows up at the Allenby Bridge, and he's got like, I don't, I would, some people have described it as a small army. Now, uh, Crown Prince Hussein bin Abdullah did this for a reason. Because he wanted to go to the Temple Mount and project power. We are in control of the Temple Mount. 
and particularly in light of these tweets that are going around Saudi Arabia, that you know we Arabs aren't really that interested in the Temple Mount anyway, our holy cities of Mecca and Medina. And the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan doesn't like that. Because the Hashemites, they used to control Jordan. Here's the foreign minister of Jordan who's in the um, in Europe this week talking to people, we've got to get a Palestinian state. It's very important that the Jordanian government, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, continue its control of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem because we're the ones who can really, the keeper of the, the holy mosque, the holy place. And they don't want to lose. And, and so you see in the background, the Saudis are going, some Saudis are going, we're not really interested in the Temple Mount. There's also a push by Israel, and it's a very difficult political thing. They don't want trouble with the Jordanians. Because a lot of, I mean, half of Jordan, maybe more than half, are Palestinians. And it would upset the Palestinians if the Jordanians lost control of the Temple Mount. And this has happened in the past to the Hashemite family. They used to control Mecca and Medina until 1924. They were the keeper of the Holy Mosque from about the 10th century to 1924. So for almost a millennium. So they remember that. And they don't want to lose control of this. And so that's why you see King Hussein, that he drive, or King Abdullah II, he drives me crazy because when he goes in and he talks about the Temple Mount, he always talks about we need to protect the Christian and Arab holy sites. He never mentions the Jewish holy sites. You want, go watch almost every video that I've played. I've played tons of them where he talks about the Temple Mount. He's always talking about Jew, or not, uh, Arab and Christian holy sites in Jerusalem, never the Jewish ones. So here's the deal. This is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. At the southern end of the Temple Mount, that was a Herod extension. That's filled dirt there. That's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It was built 7, 800 AD. That building has collapsed and been rebuilt a few times. It's, um, it's built on fill dirt. They have an earthquake, it's going to collapse. You'll see some pictures of that in just a moment. So this is King Abdullah, who uh, was given control of the Temple Mount after they lost control of Mecca Medina. He would point to the Muslim waqf, uh, Husseini al-Husseini, who was virulently anti-Jewish. He also worked with Hitler, helped Hitler, said, I, you know, we can work together to eradicate the Jews. He was the chief Muslim holy man there, and he wanted to kill the Jews. So this thing goes way back. By the way, there's some good evidence that the nephew of Husseini al-Husseini um, was a guy named Yasser Arafat. And by the way, there's also some evidence, if you research it, that Yasser Arafat and another guy named Saddam Hussein sort of have a family friendship connection in Iraq. Because Saddam Hussein was essentially trained by the same guys. In fact, when they split up the Middle East, King Abdullah got Jordan, his brother got Iraq, and ruled Iraq until about 1939 when there was a revolution there. But Saddam Hussein, so this, this is all interconnected. Um, sort of like European royalty. Everybody's marrying their cousin and whatnot. So here's it. And so the, this, but the Dome of the Rock in the center of the Temple Mount uh, pretty much stands as it did back when it was built around 691, 692 AD. Uh, and it's called, it's called the Mosque of Omar. I don't think it's really a mosque, but it's a commemorative building and it's very, it is important to Islam, to a lot of people in Islam. And there's a couple reasons for that, which I'll talk about. So inside is the foundation, what they call the foundation stone. This is where Orthodox Jews, Temple Institute, and a lot of others believe this is where the Ark of the Covenant sat when the first temple, the Solomon Temple, was there. But inside the dome, and I was in there back in 1995, when... Um, I don't think it, 
I don't think they'll let non-Muslims go inside now. Uh, there's also there's a panel on the outside of the, I wish I should have put a picture in. There's a panel of granite on, on one of the outside walls of this dome of the rock. And it looks like Satan. It's like a natural thing in the granite. And it looks like Satan. It's really creepy. Look it up. Just type Satanic panel, Dome of the Rock, and you'll be able to see a picture of it. But the other thing that's important is that inside the Dome of the Rock, there's a lot of calligraphy around the upper regions. And they're recitations from the Quran. They are probably the oldest since it was built uh, 70 years, less than 70 years after Muhammad, 60 years after Muhammad died. It's probably the earliest writings of the Quran that exist on the planet. And they have different parts of the Quran, including panels, which I've seen, that say, God has no begotten, God has no son. My point being that what I would con- when Jesus talks about when you see the abomination of desolation, you know this whatever this is will be blasphemous. It's already there. God has no son. So this, I mean, this is you cannot say that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. It's just uh, you have to be a theological. Well, you have to be. You have to have a natural wisdom beat out of you in a, in a woke critical race theory school indoctrination program to come to this conclusion. <coughs> so, excuse me. So I know I have a cough button. I can't find it in my pocket. There it is. So the, um, oh, so here's, this is the tweet from the Muslim guy. I didn't remember I had it in. So this is the Saudi guy, the Saudi cartoonist, tweeting and saying, the recent Saudi Twitter movement believes that there is no importance to the Temple Mount to Muslims and the waiting for the Jewish Third Temple, a new era, one of peace. So, but there are, so the big important point is there are Muslims talking about this. Everybody says it's impossible, this will never happen. Just be patient. Things are going to happen. You don't need to build it down in the city of David. No good archaeologist believes that. I'm sorry. I know people have made videos and they're very compelling. I'm just telling you, everybody that's involved with the third temple and reinstating sacrifices believes that it's going to be on the Temple Mount. And I don't think these sacrifices will be salvific. How you get saved, when Jesus went to the cross... Buried, rose again. That, that finished all that. That's how you get saved. You have to believe in Jesus. But nevertheless, we know that this sacrifice is coming and the abomination of desolation and that sort of thing. So, so inside the dome, there are these, it's a beautiful building. I mean, the calligraphy and the detail. Uh, but these writings around this, particularly that gold ring above, just above the arches there, That's sections of the Quran, and it says God has no son. There's also, I would call it sort of a growing scholarship. This is an article by Dr. Mordecai Kadar. There are also Muslim scholars who have written and said that this is the farthest mosque of the Quran and the Hadith. This is nonsense. There's, There's no mention of Jerusalem in the Quran. And this myth has grown up because they don't like the Jews being back in control of Jerusalem. In fact, if you look at um, a map of Jerusalem, this is from a 1965 pre-Six-Day War tourist map from Jordan. And you see it says the Haram al-Sharif, talks about Mount Moriah and that type of thing. It's a map of Jerusalem. And down there in the southern end of the Temple Mount is a building called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. What happened after the Six-Day War, remember the little headline I show you, Israel controls all of Jerusalem? Upset the Muslims. So they had to come up with a myth 
that was developed. And this myth was developed that the whole Temple Mount area is Al-Aqsa. And so now they publish websites and brochures and things such as this, saying, well, it's not just that, that's the Qibla, okay? That's the, where the thing is that we pray towards, that they believe points them towards Mecca, but it really points them towards Petra. Um, I don't think they would acknowledge that, but I've done the map out layout, and it, it goes to Petra. But so now you see that they deny that it's, this is just Al-Aqsa. It's the whole precinct of Al-Aqsa. There are also some things laying around the Temple Mount. This comes from an article about 2013 in Biblical Archaeology Review. I'm almost done. There, there was a, a, there have been earthquakes, including one that happened back I forget. What happened was the earthquake, they had to sort of rebuild foundations for Al-Aqsa Mosque. And when they did this, they found these beams, and you see these beams today laying around, there's different areas of the Temple Mount. They've looked at these beams. Because what happens in the Holy Land is that when buildings fall down, they use the fall down, the falling down, the falling down, the materials that fell down to rebuild something back up. These are old beams. They are cedars from Lebanon. Many of them are dated to the time period. They've done carbon-14 dating to the time period of Herod's temple, the second temple that Jesus was in. Now, does not scripture tell us that there were cedars of Lebanon used in the building of Solomon's temple? Mm -hmm. And Solomon's temple got torn down. And when they built it back up under Zerubbabel, maybe they used those beams. And then it got torn down. So anyway, a lot of people believe these beams, some of them, in fact, there's one beam that's dated to the ninth century BC, which is the time period of Solomon's temple. So you can find the biblical archeology span review articles about that. The exact history of the beams is hard to pin down. They were likely used in two or more different constructions and they're degrading, but there are uh, some interesting things going on. So this is why the Hashemites are upset. They're, they fear like the Saudis are being brought in by Netanyahu and the Israeli government to take over their, the last spot that they control that's really important to them. So there's, there's like all these, um, it's like an onion. You know, there's all these different layers to it. And so today I hope I was able to peel back a couple layers and show you that there's a lot more going on behind all this, but the takeaway is that, look, there is this significant economic component to the Abraham Accords. There is also this continued tension with Iran, and what is Iran going to do? It is a, um, you see the head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, the defense minister, this is how Iranians negotiate. They come out and make these statements, we're going to take you down, you're weak, we're strong, uh, etc. So it's, everything is very tense over there right now. There's also this article from the London Times the other day talking about the technology that's being used in modern warfare and algorithms and the high-tech nature of things. And you see these soldiers running around now. You see some of the shows on TV where they're, you know, they're live broadcasting to somebody sitting in a building in California or Texas what's going on in Afghanistan or some village way out in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's amazing what's happening. So again, the point is there's all this convergence of things. Next week, we'll talk a little bit about China and what China is doing with Hong Kong and technology, because that is something that and our government doesn't seem to want to do anything about it. I don't, it's almost like they're being paid off, but I don't want to make an accusation I can't back up. Um, Anyway, and again, this is 
Tehran, this is they're talking about the palace intrigue and the fighting going on within. You know, is the old crown prince going to come back? And you, if what you notice is there's usually one king comes to power, but it's after several, he's one of several crown princes that were named by the prior uh, successor. And this is what happened with Mohammed bin Salman. So anyway, uh, exciting time to be alive and uh, a lot of things going on. So always look for the economic aspect of these accords. And next week we also talk about this, which I think is important. Turkey reaching out to the Central Asian stand republics. Okay. Pay attention. A lot of things happening. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we just pray that you'll give us wisdom and understanding to understand the times in which we live. But you will always help us to keep at the forefront that uh, our ultimate responsibility is to share the gospel with those around us. We pray that you will give us opportunities to do that. But also, always help us hold fast to the truth and correct doctrine um, so that we do not stray as others have strayed in the past and continue to stray in our day and age at an increasing rate. Keep us faithful. Bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.